well, it's nice to be here. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm just a teacher, is all, and um, I'm grateful that I've been uh, invited to be part of your day. I think originally one of the people I work with at church who's a psychologist was invited to be here, and he couldn't be here. So I'm no psychologist. I'm just a simple teacher, and, uh, but I'm gr grateful to be here. Um, it's an important topic, and this is an important subject area. The family is where everything happens. If society has any problem, uh, it's because there's a problem in the family, and uh, we're seeing that today. Um, and so I've worked most of my life with kids of one age or another. I work with uh, both at church and at work with kids that are 18 to 31 now. Uh, my entire congregation at church is 18 to 31. So it's nice to talk to people. I won't have to talk about who's dating who and who everybody should marry. That's always been covered. So uh, I'll just stick with kids. And then I taught a long time for the school district in a couple of different school districts. And uh, I taught first grade, if you can even believe it. Um, I used to go home every day with a dirty shirt right here. Because if you were a first grader and you looked at me and you wanted to get my attention, really, where would you uh, pat me? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, first graders pat you, and they say, Miss Roselle. They stand really close. Sometimes I had to get used to turning around really carefully because I'd hit them, you know. I'd turn them, what? <laughs> and down they'd go, and I'd pick them up and apologize and tell them not to tell their mom, stuff like that. Um, and, uh, but I did most of my work with older kids, and I saw the, 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 um, the results of, of parents who loved and helped and, and understood their role, and I saw the results of parents who didn't. And uh, I could tell you stories, you, you probably heard millions of them, but I could tell you stories of, of wonderful kids and kids who came to school uh, every day having had a tough time. And, um, and so um, when I was a middle school teacher, I um, um, used to teach math. I was a math and science teacher. And one of the things you have to do when you teach kids is you have to help them understand the premises. Um, the first day we introduced uh, the order of operations to kids. You know, they'd have a string of numbers. Three, you know, 32 divided by four times the quantity four plus five, you know, divided by blah, 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 blah. And you just put it up there and let them work it out. And uh, they would work it out however it came to them. And, um, and so, you know, you could get five or six or seven different answers based on whether they multiplied first or added first or divided first or... And so then you would teach them uh, something some of you probably heard in school. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Parentheses, parentheses always first. Then you had to do uh, exponents. Then you had to do multiplication division as you came to it from left to right and addition subtraction as you came to it from left to right. If they didn't start at that premise, then there was no way to have to come to the right conclusion. Uh, if they switched any of those steps, their answer was wrong. And so um, in our conversation today, uh, I guess for just a minute, um, I need to let you know my premises. Now, they, I, I'm not asking these to be your premises, but if you're going to understand at least um, what I believe and the, the information I'd share with you about, about parent-child relationships, then you have to understand why I'm saying what I'm saying, or my conclusions aren't hooked to anything. Same thing with, uh, with belief in God. If, if you don't have some all, you know, correct premise to hook to, like an understanding of God, how can you come to any correct conclusions about or, uh, or assumptions about how life should go? Another problem we're having in the world today. Anyway, so um, I'm going to read just for a second. And, and again, I, I, this, is, this is to let you know where I'm from, I'm coming from, and then I'll share with you some information about parent-child relations. But, but remember, I'm just a teacher. I'm not a, I'm not a, and we have six kids. I guess that makes us someone. Um, and they're all living. We haven't killed any of them because uh, <laughs> some days, uh, I used to say our oldest daughter, Kate Glover, we love her. She's, uh, she's had her own grandchild now, and so she's back. Um, uh, and let me just say this, too. I'm going to read this document. It's called the, Pro the, the Family Proclamation of the World. I'll just read a couple of chunks of it uh, that are appropriate here. And uh, it's a statement in, in our church from um, the 
the first presidency, the first presidency, we believe in modern day prophets. We believe in prophets as, as real and as, um, as prophetic as Moses or Abraham or um, John the Baptist or the apostle, uh, John, any of those. Uh, ancient. We believe God has prophets. He always has prophets. And so this is a declaration that they made when they looked out at the world and saw the family slipping away um, into oblivion. Last, uh, it wasn't last year, I think it was 2010, 41% of all babies born in America were born to unwed mothers. Um, that's a direct reflection on families. And so, and the belief. So just, uh, let me just read a few of the little chunks here and then and then we'll talk. Um, we, the first presidency, that would be the would be the prophet. Um, and the prophet at the time was President Hinckley. He's passed away now. And the quorum of the twelve apostles. We believe in apostles and prophets on the earth. For the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, solemnly proclaim that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God, and that the family is central to the Creator's plan for the eternal destiny of His children. All human beings, male and female, are created in the image of God. Each is as a beloved spirit, son of, or daughter of our heavenly. Uh, excuse me. Each is a beloved spirit, son or daughter of heavenly parents, and as such, each has a divine nature and destiny. Gender is an essential characteristic of individual, uh, premortal, mortal, and uh, eternal identity and purpose. In the premortal realm, spirit sons and daughters knew and worshipped God as their eternal Father and accepted His plan by which His children would. Could obtain a physical body and gain earthly experience in the in earthly experience to progress progress towards perfect or perfection and ultimately realize their divine destiny as heirs of eternal life. The divine plan of happiness enables family relationships to be perpetuated beyond the grave. Sacred ordinances and covenants available to hold in holy temples make it possible for individuals to return to the presence of God and for families to be united eternally. The first commandment of, uh, that God gave Adam and Eve pertained to their potential for parenthood as husband and wife. We declare that, the God, that God's commandment for his children to multiply and replenish the earth remains in force. We further declare that God has commanded that the sacred powers of procreation are to be employed only between man and woman, lawfully wedded, as husband and wife. We declare that the means by which more, uh, mortal life is created to be divinely appointed. We affirm the sanctity of life and its importance uh, in God's eternal plan. Just one more paragraph. Husbands and wives have a solemn responsibility to love and care for, their ch for each other and for their children. Children are an heritage of the Lord. Parents have a sacred duty to rear their children in love and righteousness, to provide for their physical and spiritual needs, and to teach them to love and serve one another. Observe the commandments of God and be uh, law-abiding citizens wherever they live. Husbands and wives, mothers and fathers will be held accountable for, uh, before God for the discharge of their obligation. Well, maybe just one more thing. The family is ordained to God. Marriage between a man and woman is essential to his eternal plan. Children are entitled to birth within the bonds of matrimony and to be reared by a father and mother who honor uh, marital vows with complete fidelity. And it goes on with some other things. And so for, for me, when I look at family relations, and I, as a bishop, deal uh, in this uh, ward, I deal with potential parents. They're all single. And uh, so we do a lot of help, help uh, a lot of work to help them be ready when they get married to be able to raise children. But this is, uh, our, this is our starting point. This is our, our order of operations. Everything we do as a mother and father comes from this. And so there's just a couple of ideas on parent-child relations. Um, because I know that you have a strong belief in God as well. Um, we probably differ on points of doctrine, but in the end, we have a belief in God and that he loves us. And um, for us, family relations, because of what we believe, means that I don't own my children. Um, I'm a steward. My brothers and my children, in a spiritual sense, we, because we believe that God created all of us spiritually before we came here. Um, we have a one, Mormons are known for, for genealogy, we have a one-step uh, genealogical chart back to God. He created us. Um, in some process we don't understand, but he created us spiritually, we existed. And so my children, all six of them, are in a sense my brothers and sisters. 
and God, I come here, and uh, through the usual mortal process of having children, I'm entrusted by God to be my children's parents while I'm here, my fa their father. Uh, and um, so I'm a steward. My job is to help them be ready to return to their Heavenly Father, having learned the things that they needed to learn, um, and having uh, mastered the things they needed to master so that they can enter back into his presence. Other than that, they, uh, my children, you know, are, are my siblings in a sense. And so that doesn't mean we don't punish them. In our family, we do. Uh, I don't know where you're on the spanking issue. We were okay with it. But, um, but I, I saw them, and for, for us, that's a big thing because my job is to help them report into someone else, not to me. I'm not the end goal. And so uh, one of the things that, that we... Um, believe about uh, that helps I think with parent-child relationships is that I'm a I, don't get me wrong I'm a dad with all the dad responsibilities but my job is to help them learn so I have to act in a way that helps them to do that and that means we have rules and we have consequences and we have all that kind of stuff but my whole job is to help them understand who they are uh, a child of God and where they're going after they're here um, very different than if I saw them as my possession or a reflection of who I am or, um, or a, a status symbol of who I am. And, um, and so um, we believe, or, or another important thing to understand with parent-child relationships is that um, my job is to give them birth and raise them. Uh, it's a divine responsibility. It's a responsibility that I agreed to before I came here. So when the road gets tough and uh, my kids do things that I don't like, I put in the effort rather than, um, rather than trying to somehow uh, force them to do this and that. The, the instruction on, on conflict resolution was wonderful because it's all about training. It's not necessarily about the end goal for me in the sense of getting them to do today what I want. It's about helping them to understand how to be a responsible person. When I was about 17, we believe in keeping the Sabbath day holy, and so we don't work on, on Sunday for the most part. I mean, we have doctors and policemen, and you know, we understand that, that uh, people have to be protected. But my parents, uh, but I knew my parents' uh, thing, and so, you know, our beliefs, and I was 17 at the time, and they were kind of my beliefs, and uh, a friend of mine said, hey, Phil, you know, you want to earn 20 bucks. Well, in, you know, 1975 or whatever that was, 20 bucks was like $1,000. I mean, you know, I could go on two dates, two nice dates for 20 bucks. And so I said, you bet. He said, just meet me at the high school at, uh, at 7 o'clock Sunday morning. And we'll, well, I knew, you know, that we didn't do that. And so I went to my parents, and they were wise. And I said, Mom and Dad, here's the deal, and it's Sunday. Well, I was 17. If I was 11, first of all, I wouldn't have been driving a car, but you know what I mean. Uh, they would have said, no, you're 11, you're going to church where you don't, you're not going with your friend to clean up somebody's yard to make money or whatever it would have been when you're 11. But at 17, they understood that I needed to now decide whether I believed it or not. And so they said, choose what you want. I'm sure that they were thinking, we've taught him, he'll choose not to go. I chose to go. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was going to make my 20 bucks, man. It was a fortune. And uh, so we're, our, the, the thing was to move Hertz cars. Um, you used to be able in groups be able to go and move Hertz cars and they would pay you a certain amount to you know drive this big serpentine line of cars from one dealer one you know office to the next to, to move the cars around so that's what we were doing I was just driving you know and uh, so we're driving along and I'm like you know near the back and all of a sudden I see police sirens in my back window uh, through the, my back mirror and I think oh and their lights and so I pull over and uh, the policeman said, hey, you made an unsafe lane change. Somebody you, you know, because I'm trying to follow somebody you pulled in front of uh, had to hit their brakes pretty hard. And, you know, nobody's hurt or killed or anything. But, so I got a ticket. Anybody want to guess how much it was for? 20 bucks, yeah. <laughs> the Lord has an interesting way of doing things, doesn't he? Uh, the only time I gambled, too, I dropped in two quarters. I got two back. I didn't realize you could go to the place and say, hey, I got a thing, and they'd give you more money. I just thought, well, the Lord's sending me a message, so I've never gambled. Um, and so, realize that my parents at 17 were trying to train me, but there is, comes a time where you have to let, you know, people, 
people put it to practice, and sometimes they roam a bit. So, um, so parenting is about giving birth, yeah, and then about raising, and about a divine responsibility that, I, that we believe we accepted before we came here to do all that it would take to help our children, to, to allow space when there needs to be space, um, to, to um, you know, do all the things that you probably heard today, to pick carefully when you have a mate, because when you're looking for a spouse, because that person is going to be the person for us. The mother is going to have the main responsibility of nurturing the children. Um, we believe that's by divine design. It doesn't mean dads can't and don't, but they just, you know. So when we play a game, my wife lets people win and I, <laughs> I beat them. So, nah, you know, and dads have a responsibility to provide and to teach the kids how to do that. And so we, we accept those roles. And so part of being a good parent means that I'm out doing all that I can do as a dad to make sure that my kids have what they need, not necessarily what they want, but what they need, and to be very careful about the balance between what they want and what they need, because kids want everything. And when I was a kid, there was only so many things you could want, there wasn't that much stuff. And so now there's a bunch of stuff, and uh, it's hard to do that, it's hard to hold the line and to say we're not, you don't need that, um, when you have all their friends have it. Um, anyway, and so, um, we, ex we accepted the responsibility to be, in a sense, and when it has to be, the line and to hold it even when they don't want to hold it. At the same time, we accepted to be listeners and hearers and acceptable, accepting that our children are not, for us, didn't spring out of nowhere. They came from uh, another existence where they would have been, I guess, adults, and so that they're just relearning some things and we have to coach them through that. In some cases, we have to let them stub their toe when that's appropriate, okay? Anyway, I told you I was just a teacher, that's all. Um, I already mentioned that we're a steward over our children and so um, one of the things that, that we um, believe is that we're raising them for Heavenly Father so we're very scripture-based in, in our faith and we're trying to um, make sure that we would do it, we would do the things that God would have us do if he were raising them. Um, uh, we also believe that um, we teach by precept and example, which means that if I want my children to be responsible, I have to be responsible. If I want them to be patient, I have to be patient. Uh, if I want them to listen, I have to listen, and even when I think they, what they're saying is dumb and they don't know what they're talking about. And they usually don't. I mean, you know, I'll be honest. Um, but they do, you know, they are having a life, and we do need to, to clue into that. I have had to on many occasions, except that I really don't know the world that they live in. Now, for a long time, when I went to the schools that they were at, when I was their principal of several of our kids, I knew we lived in Palmdale. If you've ever been to Palmdale, um, you know, uh, regularly I wrestled kids to the ground and stuff. Um, and it was a K-5, no, I was in junior high, but, um, <laughs> but uh, regularly I did often stood between parents trying to get to their kids that we've had to call the social services because they beat their children. And, uh, you know, now they want to pick the kid up and they don't get to and the police don't get there uh, yet. And so, and so um, when we moved here and our kids went to schools, we live in Bray, our kids went to schools, they said, Dad, they, these guys think they have gangs, they don't have gangs. We know what gangs are like. And so, you know, we had, uh, we had to, to realize that if we wanted to teach them to be peaceable, and to walk away from conflicts, we had to do that, which is not always easy. And so um, we teach by precept and example um, who our children, um, who I teach them who they are and who they can become. And that is the tough part. So um, that's kind of the premise from which um, we talk about parent and child relationships. And um, there are some positive things that uh, you can do to, to, um, uh, to help nurture that. Uh, there's obviously some things you cannot. Uh, so here's just a few ideas. One of the things that you can do is uh, talk and, and make time to talk with your children on a regular basis as individuals. Um, we call those personal interviews. You can call them whatever you want. Literally, you make time on a monthly basis to, to, to spend time with uh, the kids on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And you, at that point, as a parent, ask them questions. 
uh, about their life, about things that are going on. I, I will tell you, uh, both as a school principal and as a bishop uh, that works with kids, um, you know this, uh, maybe, but kids are exposed to way more, way earlier than we think. And, um, and so you need to talk with them and ask them specific questions. Now, those questions would probably be specific to you and your faith and, and what you expect as a family, but you need to ask them. And you need to ask them pretty clearly. Um, one thing I've learned as a bishop is that um, in our church, we, have, we don't have confessional as you might think of it, but confession is part of the repentance process. So if somebody has violated the laws of God, they, they, depending on the, the type of problem, if, uh, sin they've committed, part of the process is to speak with a bishop. And so I talk with, with uh, well, members of my ward, and they'll come in, and it's interesting because they'll say, well, uh, I was out with my boyfriend, and we did some things we shouldn't have done. I said, well, what did you do? They'll say, well, way more than we should have. I said, okay. Uh, what, it, what happened? Well, boy, things I don't think Heavenly Father wanted me. Sometimes it takes eight times, you know. It takes me eight times going, what does that mean? Because they try to protect themselves from really admitting. And until I've learned, until you have, until you, it's out on the table and you've talked about what it really is and what they really did, you, you, first of all, I don't think they can make it right with God because we really curb things off for ourselves. Have you ever done that? Have you ever come home or gone, been on your way and a train came, you're on your way to work and you were going to be late anyway, but a train came and so suddenly at work the train made you late and you just want to add the er, the train made me later, but I was going to be late anyway. You know, I mean, that's the real truth. The real truth was I was late and the train postponed me further, but we don't say that part because it's just easier not to. So as, you, as we um, talk with kids, you've got to get really, really clear about what's going on in their life, and you have to ask specific questions. And a lot of times that's just not comfortable to do. Um, uh, but if you don't do that, then you, know, you think you're talking about one thing and they think they're talking about another thing. There you go. And uh, you don't really know. So I, I was talking with somebody years ago, and um, you know, they gave me the usual blah, 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 blah. And what really they were, they were doing is they were, they were interacting with you know, people in an immoral way for money. That's really what they were doing, but they'd never once admitted that to themselves. Until they did that, we can talk. So, so one idea or one thing with, to improve parent-child relationships is to spend some time talking with them. And uh, I made that sound like you're going to grill them. I really don't mean that. You need to have some time just catching up on their lives. But there has to be some things in your family that are important, and there are. And you just have to check in on those. And you have to talk. And you have to get their input. And you have to ask them what they think. Okay. Um, I'm probably speaking to the choir here, but um, one of the things that's important is, is uh, worshiping together and, uh, and having regular, for us, it would be family prayer in the morning at night, it would be scripture study. Uh, again, that will be appropriate to you, to you and your customs, but, but it would be some ongoing worship together. And for us, we read the scriptures together, and boy, you can really tell how somebody's doing when they're reading the scriptures. There's just something about having to read the words and if there's things going wrong in their life. And I, I'm not going to make this sound like a big, you know, investigation. But here again, um, that's what we do. That's what parent-child relationships are. My job is to train. Now, have a lot of fun. We had, did a lot of fun things. We'd go to Disneyland and, you know, go on all the rides and pretty much eat our way, <laughs> so eat our way through the park. That was my big thing. But... Um, we had did a lot of fun things, but studies have shown that dads, especially, uh, who have a major impact on children's identity, both male and female in their family, cannot make up in two weeks in the summer what the kids need on a regular basis every day. That doesn't mean quit your jobs and stay home, but that does mean on a regular weekly basis, you need to have some interaction with your kids in a meaningful way. Family dinner is a great place to do that and to look at each other. And to, it's amazing what you can find out if you're, you sit around the table and take the time to, to just, just eat together and uh, just be sociable. 
Um, kids in increasing way don't want to do that, but that's okay. You just say, we're eating at six, and here we go, and, and depending on what you're having, it'll be easier or harder. Um, and so, but, but spending time with them, doing some things that are fun on a regular basis, working together, which is harder and harder in our society. There's just less and less to do. Um, it's so much easier in, uh, for, for us, adult, older people, to hire a gardener, um, but sometimes doing the yards, what there is to do. Um, but working together is critical, worshiping together, playing together, and then making sure that they understand that you have a standard and that it's important to you far beyond because it's you. Um, hopefully we've raised our children so that our parent they know that um, if they do things that we believe are, un are wrong, I, I'm sure they, they worry about disappointing my wife and I, but we've far had them understand far more have them understand that they would be disappointing their Heavenly Father. And, um, and that that is the bigger motivator. Because guess what? My wife and I are imperfect. And we're in, as much as we try to be consistent, which is, uh, you know, a hallmark of being a good parent, we're inconsistent. And quite honestly, sometimes we look inconsistent even when we're dealing with each child individually because we had six. And uh, other than the fact that they broke down evenly, boy, girl, we have three and three, so we say in our family it's a fair fight. Um, and, and actually, mathematically, it broke down that way, too. Um, we have three mathematicians and three kids who I hope their spouses do the checkbook because they will never <laughs> be able to do it. I'm the mathematician in our family, and I, my wife finally leaned over and said, as I was ready to wring our oldest daughter's neck because she couldn't get out of algebra or something, she said, honey, I don't think she's a math person. <laughs> and uh, I, f I had to say, oh, I guess she won't be because math is so simple. I don't know. I still don't know how she can. But, um, that's just something I had to accept and move on. She was always going to get C's in math. That's just it. Uh, now our next daughter down, and it goes every other kid, too, so I don't know if that's some kind of a weird thing, but our oldest is not math, second is math, third is not, fourth is math. <laughs> um, I just had to accept. And um, anyway, so, so there's some things that, that um, you need to work through, but you need to play, you need to know that there's some things. But my wife and I are not perfect, and our kids know that. And, in, and as they get older, they clearly see that. And so if their devotion is to me based on who we are, it's going to be really easy to eventually say, well, mom and dad, you don't, you know. But if we've always pointed them to a perfect God who never makes mistakes and loves them perfectly, even when he lets his, those he loves suffer and doesn't heal them or send relief right away, or, then they have a constant guide uh, of faith that they can look to. And we have, as parents, we have to do our best to, to make sure that we're doing our best to be as good as we can be and as, and as consistent. Um, let's see, there's, I don't know, I'm Paul, I'm just, as I said, I'm just a teacher. I'm sure there's scientific stuff. I've looked up a lot of scientific stuff over the years, both for our own kids and for counseling people. Um, but I didn't document a lot of stuff. Anyway. The, here's the last thing I will say, and this is going to sound a little maybe like something you've already heard, and then I'll be done, um, is a huge part, I think, of parent-child relationships is mom and dad relationship. If mom and dad are on board together, then parent-child relationships will go better. Um, our kids learned early on there was no going around dad, going to mom, that mom and dad actually spoke about stuff and <laughs> said, I think your mom said no. And so we just learned to talk. If, if we didn't, our kids, uh, and they're all, our youngest is 18 now, our, our kids would never have driven on the freeway yet because my wife was scared to death to let them out on the freeway. And I said, for, in, our, in our church, we go on missions, so we've had a son serve in Africa. Well, an island, coast off the, uh, an island cluster off the coast of Africa and one serve in Paraguay. We had a daughter serve in the far upland of Idaho. Uh, but Spanish speaking. So, uh, and so I told my wife I, in private, we always counsel together in private. In public, she said, no, you can't drive to the dance. And um, that's the way it was. And then later in private, I said, honey, here's the thing. You know, one day soon, they're going to be in outer Slambovia or wherever, you know, because we don't choose where they go. Um, that's assigned by an apostle. And um, 
you know, you're going to be driving, <laughs> you're going to drive to a whole other country. The last day of our son's mission in Paraguay, he fought with a 50-year-old man who was driving the bus because they paid for sitting seats and not standing seats on the bus in a whole other language and a culture I'll never see. And, uh, and we had to start some of that development before he ever left our home. And so the most important part of good child, or a critical part of good child-parent relationships is good parent-to-parent -parent relationships, one where you can talk together. When I counsel new soon-to-get-married couples, uh, along with all the stuff that's important, they have to be attracted to each other. They have to be compatible in a lot of ways. But I'll say the most important thing you can find about somebody that you're going to marry is you have to be able to counsel together. Because your spouse has to be able to come to you and say, hey, I've got an issue with this or that. And, and everybody has to know nobody's leaving. You're not getting divorced because you made, made uh, the uh, meatloaf with oatmeal, my wife's family, instead of bread, like my family. And uh, early on, we learned, I had to go to her and say, honey, I just don't think we can make the oatmeal. Can we make it differently? Um, and she took that counsel, and I think proven to be right. Uh, and then there's times where she comes to me and says, honey, we can't do that. You know, you can't, we can't, you've got to be, you've got to do, and we just counsel together, but always in private, always uh, making sure it's consistent with our core beliefs, and we help each other develop that way, both as people, because part of what that document said at the beginning is we're here to develop. I'm here to help my kids develop. I want them to be responsible, good people. I don't care what they do for a living, it has to be legal but they need to be hard workers. My dad was a school principal, and I was a school principal for a long time, so a while it was a little eerie, because um, we looked alike and so forth, but, um, but he had to be good people. So we, we learned to counsel together. So I just encourage you as, uh, you know, as, you, as you live and as you encourage your kids as they get married, they have to be able to counsel together, because then you can have a united front, because uh, not to make this sound too dire, but you know, kids want to do what they want to do. And they don't have a clue a lot of the time, you know. And so we have to pick the, the destination, include them, encourage them, train them, be united with them. And if you can't counsel with your spouse, if both people don't have an equal voice and be able to say together, um, we're going to, you know, this is what we're going to do, then it's going to be tough to have children that will honor that. Part of the, the proclamation says that uh, in families, mothers nurture, uh, fathers provi uh, preside. And it also says that fathers preside in the home. Um, now that sounds like a little, I mean, that could be so cool. If I could call all the shots, I would. But pr what preside means is, for what preside, the person who presides is the person who has um, the responsibility to make sure all members of the family are heard. And um, my wife and I counsel together. and. Um, there was something I was going to say there, but my wife and I counsel together, and, and we come together to what we're going to say. If, if we can't come to a conclusion about something, we don't make the decision because it has to be unanimous. There's a time where my wife says, honey, you feel strongly about it. You make the decision. There are times where I feel more strongly about something. She's, I, or she feels more strongly. I say, honey, you. But we, we don't make the decision because we believe that we're led by the Spirit of God who teaches all man what they should do. And if we're both in tune with that, then God's going to send us the same message. So if, if we don't come up with the same decision, then one of us isn't listening. And my responsibility is to go back and figure out if it's me, not if it's her. And uh, we continue to work together and pray together and fast together until we know. And then we implement those rules, uh, depending on the age of the kids, with their input. And sometimes, you know, when they're babies, not. And then we move forward as a family, but always towards God. So I, I hope that helped. Um, that's just my, my take. If Brother G, G had come, he would have given you all the psychologist stuff. I have a brother who's a psychologist, very interesting stuff. But that's just my take. And so I, I just uh, want to let you know that uh, God lives, that he loves us. You know that. We believe that. And that um, uh, if we don't fight the battle with, to make our family strong, uh, not only will the nation go down, but, but our families will die. And, and that's the whole reason we're here. And I share that with you. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. And I'm not going to be your first grader coming in. <laughs>
So we'd like to give you the certificate of appreciation. Thank you so much. I think we have a lot of similarities and, and, and common practices amongst the um, both faiths. Uh, we share a lot in the principles. When my son was in high school a couple years ago, he wanted to go on a weekend trip with a couple of his friends. And I said, who are your friends? He said, Mom, don't worry, they're Mormons. I said, all right, go. <laughs> I said, by all means. Uh, one thing that I really love that I, I, I think that we, we have a very uh, deep connection with is that we believe in the same thing, that eventually our call must be answered to God. And that is our duty, is that ultimately our return is to him. And that is our role and responsibility, is to make sure not only for ourselves, but our children also learn that bridge to cross over to the right way. So on, on that, uh, we go hand in hand in that, in that life. Uh, we're going to break right now for about five minutes, so please, if you need uh, the restrooms, snack. And, and also, another thing, if you paid online for this uh, uh, event, please see the youths because um, you've got money coming back to you uh, because they, I think there was like a $2 uh, overcharge there. So if you did pay online, see them. And please, let's uh, break for about five minutes and come back and continue. Thank you. <laughs>